This story includes a lot of paranoia and may be a long shot, but anyway, here we go. My family and I lived in a nice house in a relatively friendly town from the time I was six all the way until I was 11. The town was generally very safe, other than the time some guy tried to lure my sister into his car. From the very day we moved in, for some reason the neighbors across the street really hated my family. We were never quite sure why really. We figured it was because my mom had accidentally parked on their side of the street the first time we visited the home. Regardless, we embarked on a five-year battle with them that continued back and forth until the day we inevitably moved out. This story comes from the strange and somewhat creepy slash unexplainable things that occurred while we lived across the street from them. The husband and father of that household was in his mid-forties, I believe. He was bald, and he always gave me this real creepy vibe. He would always stare at his teenage daughter, or my mom. For the sake of the story, we'll call him Joe. Joe's father happened to be very important in the township, for some reason I can't really remember. This meant that Joe pretty much thought he ran my street, the neighborhood, and basically anything within a two-mile radius of his home. He really did whatever he pleased. This included taking my mom's parking spot, cursing and yelling at us, staring at us, and giving us dirty looks as well. He accused us of messing with his things all the time too, but we always just tried to ignore him. Of course, we hadn't touched his vehicle or any of his other stuff, but he seemed willing to do anything to make us move out. About a year and a half before we eventually did leave that street, things took a turn for our little feud. My mom was the type of person to just wash things off as a joke, so she would constantly make fun of his accusations and petty insults. That was until he installed cameras. He claimed to the cops in our area that the cameras were to prove that we were in fact messing with the cars. The only issue with his story was this. The cameras did not face his vehicles or in fact any piece of his property. They faced directly at our house all the way across the street. This meant none of his property was even in frame. To make matters even worse, one of his cameras was pointed directly through my window. I was only 10 at the time, mind you, so from that point on, my mom made me keep my shades down and curtain closed at all times. Other neighbors who had been friends with him in town told us they had gone to his house and seen the video footage in which he seemed to be spying on me. I still get chills just thinking about that. As if those cameras weren't bad enough though, there were various points in time in which our basement would be broken into and holes would be drilled into the pipes. We had doors outside that led to our basement stairs, but no matter how much we locked them, the breaking in and drilling never stopped. Eventually, we even had to nail wooden boards to that entrance to seal it up. A few months before we moved, my mom had come home from the store late one night to see someone jumping over the fence that separated our yard from the street. The guy stayed in his car, and instead of driving away, just stared at her through the window. To this day, my mom is convinced all these things were Joe, pulling them to get us to leave. Well, sure enough, in the end, they worked. This happened a few days ago, and I'm still pretty shaken up about it. On Friday afternoon, I got a call from my friend named Sarah, asking if I wanted to meet her and another friend named Lisa at Dunkin' Donuts, as we hadn't seen each other in quite a while. The Dunkin' Donuts was a 15-minute walk away from my house, so I decided I would walk there instead of driving. Besides, the weather was very nice that day. I got there and found where Sarah and Lisa were sat, so I went to join them. As we were chatting and having fun, I noticed my sister Elena was sat at a table in the corner of the room with her friend Jess. I excused myself from the table and went over to them. My sister and her friend are both 18 years old for reference. My sister still lives with my parents, whereas I live alone. They were sat at a table with three seats, so I went to sit down and catch up with both of them. They both jumped up a little bit, but then looked more relieved than anything to see me. 
Immediately, Elena whispered to me, Don't look now, but the guy in the blue shirt over there? I think he's following Jess and I. I glanced over and saw a middle-aged man sat at a table facing away from us. He's passed our table a good five times in the past 20 minutes to go to the bathroom, but he always walks slower whenever he passes us by, she continued. I told them they were most likely just being paranoid. Surely there was nothing to worry about. For their peace of mind though, I offered to leave with them so they wouldn't feel as worried. I walked back over to my table and explained the situation to Sarah and Lisa. Both of them laughed it off and assumed my sister to be paranoid. Literally only a minute later though, I saw the man get up from his seat and start walking towards the bathroom. My eyes followed him, and sure enough, he walked extremely slowly past Elena and Jess. In fact, it was almost comical how obvious he was. Both of them looked in my direction, and I nodded to show them that I had seen what he was doing. About five minutes later, I went into the toilets myself. On my way, I passed by them and whispered to them I was ready to leave whenever they were. They both agreed they were ready to go right now. I was just going to go to the bathroom real quick, and we could leave right after I'd done my business. Elena had come in her own car, so she was going to give me a lift back as well. I went into the toilet stall, did my business, washed my hands. I was walking down the corridor back into the main eating area when both of them rushed to me. I asked them what was wrong, and they explained another man had joined that strange creeper, and both of them had been pointing and staring at them. They rightfully felt unsafe. We walked back to the eating area. I put my money on our table and explained to Lisa and Sarah that I was taking off. I would explain what was going on when I got home. We all piled into Elena's car and left that creep's car in the rear view mirror. After a two minute drive, we reached my house. Just then, I remembered I had been meaning to return something I had borrowed from my mother, so I asked her to drive me with them, since they were going there anyway. I jumped out of the car to get what I needed when my phone rang. It was Elena. She explained that car from those two men had driven past and pulled into a random driveway. The driver of the vehicle was for sure the creep from Dunkin' Donuts. I looked out my window. Sure enough, there was a car there which didn't belong to the owner of that house parked right in their driveway. I ushered the girls into my own home and locked the door tight. I instructed Elena to take a photo of the car and its license plate, and I told Jess to call 911, as she gave the operator more information about the man than I could. Elena took the photos, and we sort of gathered around Jess as she was speaking to the operator. She had just finished telling the story. I heard the operator assure us the police would be at my house soon. A few minutes passed by, and there was a loud knock at the front door, followed by a voice shouting through it. It's the police! Open up! We all did a sigh of relief as I went to go open the door. Jess told the operator it seemed they had arrived, and then she hung up. I was just about to unlock it, when I had the thought to look through the peephole at the top of the door first. I peered through, only to see there was no police officer. It was that same guy. I froze in fear. I didn't know what to say. We didn't call the police! I managed to shout back to the man through the door. Elena and Jess were both confused as to why I just said this. We had a call, sir, the man shouted back. You have the wrong address. Go away, I yelled. I informed the girls it was that same creep at the door, not an officer. They were both extremely scared now, as was I. I was about to tell Jess to call the police again until I heard the sirens coming around the corner. Sir, you have to let me in right now, the man shouted. I didn't answer this time. He was pounding desperately on the door, commanding for me to let him in. Eventually, it turned into begging and pleading. I heard the car pull up and some commotion outside. An actual police officer then knocked on the door. I let him in after checking the peephole first. The officers took the man into custody, while another officer took Elena and Jess into the dining room for some brief questioning. I called my parents and Jess called hers as well. Both were here extremely quickly once we told them everything that happened. The man was found with a kitchen knife on his person and some other weapons in his car as well. Who knows what could have happened if I hadn't looked through the peephole first.
let me preface this encounter with a bit of background, as I'll most likely post more of my encounters later. You see, I'm in my mid-twenties, but due to my father's work, I've been all over the globe. In the space of 11 years, from 8-ish to around 19, I lived for varying amounts of time in five different countries, while visiting about six or seven more. All of this is not even including my home country, and very short holidays as well. Coupled with my bipolarity, type 1 with rare MDEs, and functioning insomnia, it made me keep a meticulous journal from the moment I could write. This has also allowed me to have a whole truckload of experiences that make me feel very fortunate. Of course, for all the good, there's some bad ones mixed in every now and then. For the past 10 months or so, I've worked as a night porter in a pretty well-known hotel in a medium-sized city in the UK. This place has been around for decades and is immensely popular for its funeral teas and wakes, as morbid as that might be. This is because it's right across the road from one of the larger local cemeteries, about a kilometer from one of the larger churches, and to top it off, less than three kilometers from the crematorium. It's perfectly situated for the mourner's business, to say. So, a couple of weeks ago, I had almost finished up my shift, when the sweet old guy that's the cemetery's groundkeeper came in, on the verge of tears. His name is Jacob, and he was the epitome of an adorable, kind old man. He even volunteered to work there, even though he was retired. That's just how nice he was. Yeah, Jacob came in about 7.50, as I was waiting for the morning shift folks to turn up so I could go home. He started blabbering incoherently, as emotionally overwhelmed people tend to do. I tried to calm him down, and asked if he wanted a cuppa. Obviously, that was a yes. Five minutes later, he was sat down with a cup of tea, telling me about what was wrong. Some idiot had jumped the fence and overturned a bunch of headstones and spray-painted vile crap on the epitaphs, even partially dug into some graves. By the time he'd calmed down fully, I said my shift was finished now, and I told him I'd help him get them upright at the very least. The man was just too nice, but I couldn't just leave him like this. Roll on a couple of hours and all the stones were back in order. I went home shattered. Those things are heavy as hell. I was happy to have helped, though. I told my work I'd probably be a little late the next morning, and they understood. Anyway, I get to my shift a couple hours late. Turns out I'm going to be on my own after two, as my colleague's second job needed him in early as hell. 2 a.m. comes around. Everything was almost in order. I was just adding the finishing touches to a large funeral tea in one of our function suites when I heard a knocking noise. At first, I thought it was someone in the room upstairs walking the halls or something, and dismissed it. But the knocking happened again, and became slowly louder. Third time's the charm, I suppose. I found the source. One of the fire exits next to the function suite. More specifically, the fire exit directly across from the cemetery. Obviously, I was not going to open that door. I couldn't even if I wanted to. They were all alarmed at night. That didn't matter, though, as the knocking suddenly stopped. Not for long, though. It started again from another fire exit, closer to the car park and front exit. It was much louder now, so I knew exactly where it was coming from straight away. It stopped again. In a minor panic, I sprinted my way towards the front door and made sure it was locked. Then I grabbed the night porter's best friend from behind reception, a walking stick. I could see my visitor's silhouette in the car park, walking slowly towards the entrance in the darkness. Definitely a man, at least a foot taller and a little bit broader than I was. He was wearing one of those stupid ankle-length goth trench coats with a hood and buckles by the billion fold. The man stopped just outside the light. He was obviously staring at me. I could faintly make out a creepy, shit-eating grin on his face. He started to take something from behind his back. I braced, wondering what he was going to do. It looked like he had a very large brick or something. I thought he was about to smash the front door open and attack me. But instead, he did something far stranger. He placed this brick-like thing on the ground slowly at his feet. Then, with a very weirdly chipper demeanor, he waved and flashed a toothy grin at me before fading away into the darkness, towards the cemetery side entrance. 
Needless to say, I waited and checked the cameras around the building before venturing out to see what he'd left there. It ended up being one of those small headstone markers with the words, you forgot this one, sprayed all over it in bright green paint. To add even more creep factor, the stone was for a bloody baby's grave and an old one at that. Not cool at all. I locked up again and phoned the police. A couple hours later and a lot of footage from the CCTV scanned, the police left with only a fuzzy frame shot of him that was basically a shape of darkness on darkness and nothing else to go by. So let me start off by saying I move around a lot in between SoCal and Arizona. At the time of this story, December 2015, I was still living in Southern California at my grandma's apartments. I'd gotten a seasonal job at Toys R Us to do something with my time and learn some people skills. I'm a 24 year old girl and have pretty extreme social anxiety. I find it really hard to talk to people sometimes, so I figured this job would help me out a bit. Another important thing to mention, my grandmother is on a government program with reduced housing cost and has a two bedroom apartment ever since my grandfather passed away. Due to the annual check at her complex though, she's supposed to be the only inhabitant of her dwelling. Technically, I was not supposed to be living there with her, but she liked the help and company, and I liked being rent free. Since I wasn't supposed to be there though, I technically had to sneak around and most definitely could not park on the parking grounds for the complex as it would draw quite a bit of attention. Luckily, there was a cemetery just across the street from the complex, then a half mile of houses leading down the street next to the cemetery, along which most of the visitors for the houses and apartments nearby parked. I was getting rent free and staying with my grandma, which was awesome to me, even if it meant I had to park half a mile away and walk. So, all was well for a few months, from when I got the job in October, minus a scary incident with a stalker at work. Eventually though, they started putting me on night shifts, which I definitely didn't mind since I tended to be a night owl anyway. Also, if you've ever been on closing shift at any retail store, you know you can easily stay an hour or two overtime after the store closes, doing reshop during holiday season. It was early December at the time, so I ended up getting off work past 2 a.m. Around this hour at this time of year in this part of SoCal, the mist gets unbearably thick, to the point of having to drive 30 miles per hour down the freeway with brights on and still being unable to see even a foot or two in front of your car. Tonight was one of those nights. I wasn't too bothered by it at the time though. It did set off my anxiety a little bit. So by the time I got home, it took me nearly 20 minutes to find a parking space. I was pretty anxious. Of course, with my luck, I had to park at the very end of the half mile stretch. Now, it was kind of a tradition of mine when I got out of the car to close the door and linger nearby for a minute while I audibly stretched a bit and sometimes complained about my day. Just a little habit thing I did. Tonight was no different. I immediately tucked my purse under my arm turned on my phone flashlight and stuck it in front of my face to see where the hell I was going. The fog was so thick I couldn't even see my hand right in front of me. I had walked in this weather many times before, so I knew my way home by heart. A straight shot walk for half a mile and a sharp turn left at the very end of the cemetery, then crossing the street and into the gated complex. I was on my merry way until I heard it. A loud, almost obnoxious cough and footsteps approaching. My alert mode set in right away. I started walking faster instantly, trying to be a lot quieter about my movements. Call me paranoid, but I've had my fair number of creepy moments. I certainly wasn't keen about meeting this stranger walking behind me. Especially so given I couldn't even see a foot in front of my face even with the streetlights and my cell phone flashlight. This continued for a few minutes, with an occasional cough from behind me. Then I'd hear a whistle, the kind cat callers do. This bewildered me because one, you can't see shit, and two, since you can't see shit in this weather, I assume this person must be purposefully intimidating me. At this point I gave up on walking altogether and broke into a sprint. 
I could hear the person behind me break into a full-blown run as well. I could hear painting now. Clearly, this person was not in the best shape. Neither was I, honestly, but the run didn't win me out nearly as bad. By now, I was speedwalking next to the cemetery. For some godforsaken reason, my panicked mind told me it would be better to duck in there and hide, instead of just walking straight home. Had there been no fog, I would have had a clear view of my grandma's apartment from the area where I stood. I quickly hid by crouching behind the entrance post to the cemetery gates. I knew I fucked up right away. His footsteps stopped too. I could tell he knew I was hiding, because he couldn't hear me walking anymore. I crouched there for what seemed like ten minutes, too scared to turn on my phone, for fear of him being close enough to see the light and find me. Too scared to make a run for it, for fear that he was still listening out for my steps. I had figured out he was standing probably five to ten feet from where I was at the entrance driveway to the cemetery, right before the gates, which was confirmed when minutes later, I heard him call out, I know you're there, sweetheart. I heard the distinct sound of a lighter being struck, and then smelled cigarette smoke. I figured this guy was now focused on his cigarette, so I made a run for it across the cemetery, somehow not tripping over any graves. The cemetery's main entrance was wrought iron fencing, but the back and right end were wooden, and served as a separator between the cemetery and backyards of various houses. The other side, which was in front of my grandmother's apartment, was chain link. There was no other entrance or exit. I did know, though, that the chain link fence didn't go all the way to the ground. I laid down on my stomach, pushed the fence up and out, and wriggled across. I ran directly across the street to my grandma's house, pounding on the door until she opened. I don't know how this dude even found me. He must have been standing around nearby as I parked and heard me complaining to myself loudly when I got out of the car. Either way, that was one of the most terrifying experiences I ever had.